Hello, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Farkas. He is coming from Los Angeles. Um, and um, he did his PhD in Israel uh, uh, with a Fulbright uh, scholarship. And then he moved to the United States. He spent some time at the University of Connecticut, then some time at the uh, University of Washington, then, University of, uh, then Carnegie Mellon University where I was uh, director of a center for light microscopy uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, an NSF center. Uh, then he moved to uh, Los Angeles at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Um, and um, in the past several years, he's been busy with uh, startup companies. He has great experience with uh, starting them and uh, taking them to the next level. So um, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, topic. I don't know if you are going to talk to us about that a little bit. Uh, we have great interest in uh, um, your experience with, with um, uh, industry and with startup companies. Uh, but today's talk uh, mainly is going to be about multimodal uh, biomedical optical imaging for the clinic. And uh, Daniel. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I'm grateful for the kind invitation to uh, Professor waxman Hoju and Professor Nicolau. Um, I hope to give you an overview of uh, what we have been uh, working on. And the details are less important than the methodological conclusions and the attempt to get into the clinic and make a difference in people's lives. So uh, those are my affiliations. The ones in parentheses are recent uh, past ones. And uh, the green ones, obviously, are not just companies, but also by way of disclosure. Uh, and these are pictures of the various places. Uh, I shall explain the title, and I don't think I have to explain the subtitle. It's uh, just an homage to one of your most famous alumni, uh, Leonard Cohen. Uh, but I do want to talk about how the light gets in. <clears throat> so uh, I usually get in time trouble towards the end of my talk, so I always put the acknowledgments up front. And the people particularly in bolded uh, uh, characters are the ones whose work I'm going to uh, highlight. And uh, especially uh, Dr. Vasefi here, uh, Dr. Novacek, and Dr. Huang. <coughs> and we have a lot of collaborators. So my slides are kind of busy, and think of them as, as Baroque, or think of them as being the top of a stack of slides. But uh, hopefully, they will convey a relatively simple idea, each of them. Uh, this one is to illustrate what we think about as translational uh, work. So the idea is that as uh, you go from laboratory-based findings towards the clinic, you try to extract the most interesting uh, conclusions, lessons, and, and applications and uh, put them to use in the clinic. And we all know that this is desirable, and we also know that it's not working quite as well and certainly not quite as efficiently as it should. So therefore, it raises the question, why is that? So as you go here from left to right, you see the disciplines involved. You see the, the organizational levels all the way from molecules to, to living, living humans. And uh, on the bottom, the organizational levels. And then uh, there's also obviously an informatics uh, uh, component to this. And so you see genomics, proteomics, all very much on the rise. But last I looked, the most important omics is uh, still economics. And the, the dollar signs on the bottom are a severely super logarithmic uh, uh, representation of what the money is. And so the couple of dollar signs at the end there in the clinic, those are trillions of dollars we are talking about. And the in-between space is really not that particularly well covered. And this becomes even more obvious if you look at where the research is mostly, where the uh, uh, clinical need uh, uh, is mostly, and also what the diagnosis is. So on the current uh, practice, uh, at best, you extract a piece of tissue from the patient, and you bring it to the middle to diagnose it by, let's say, histopathology, very much like you could do 100 years ago. And if that doesn't give a clear answer, then maybe you look for molecular markers and so forth. Uh, that is probably no, not the most efficient way to, to do it. So ideally, you would like to overlap these arrows, but not overlap them on the research side, but overlap them on the clinical side, like that. And so we are mostly working on overlapping these arrows on the clinical side in the sense that you could do molecular and cellular level work in the living body of a, of a patient. And if you think that that's a novel idea, 
uh, here's uh, Francis Bacon, no less, that, uh, you know, 400 years ago or, or so, n not having seen a microscope, he just says basically microscopes are great, but what would be really great is to have microscopic resolution in the body. Then you can really say something. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at what I think is going to be kind of the foreseeable future of modern medicine for the last, let's say, the next 50 years. Minimal invasive surgery, molecular medicine, and regenerative medicine. Uh, minimal invasive surgery and endoscopy basically is taking over from regular surgery. And you would assume that it's one of the most sophisticated uh, undertakings on the planet, but I'm here to tell you that it's not. But it could be. Uh, molecular medicine is also very exciting. Uh, improved diagnosis, uh, uh, irrational drug design, gene therapies, and personalized custom drugs. Of course, it's, it's very worthwhile to have. And regenerative medicine, uh, possibly even more exciting, because not only can you, in principle, fix things, you can actually make them better than they ever were if you do things right. So now, <clears throat> the main point I would like to make through multiple illustrations at various levels of biological organization is that light is a very powerful investigational tool and in certain ways it's still underutilized, especially as advanced optical imaging is still very underutilized. And uh, why that is, <clears throat> you can look at it this way, that uh, as Yogi Berra said, you can see a lot by just looking. So a lot of modern medicine still uses this very, very subjective, human limited ways of looking, whether it's uh, uh, histopathology or, or you know, in, in the dermatology field, looking at very serious potential things like melanoma, we still look at them and treat them the same way as we could have done in the Roman Empire, basically. Look at it, see it, see it being ugly and cut it out. That shouldn't be like that, and, and uh, let's see what we can do about it. Uh, some of you might recognize this picture. It's the Mars rover, and the reason I'm showing it is that today, we can image dust on Mars significantly better in terms of pixel resolution, spatial resolution, discrimination ability, and so forth, better than we can image inside the human being in serious trouble in one of our best hospitals. So if you take these three fields and map them onto the type of imaging that is needed, endoscopic, molecular, and, and, and functional, there's no reason why they cannot be one and the same. And that would allow you to, to engage in modern clinical intervention in which you're coupling temporally and spatially much more tightly diagnosis, advanced diagnosis based on advanced optical imaging and intervention. And so I, I would like to illustrate a few of these things in applications that we have tackled through the years. Uh, by the way, that was the old Mars rover. The new Mars rover has something like 26 cameras and lasers that, that uh, pulverize a, a rock and, and, and so on. So we are, as, as technologists, it should give us pause that, that we are falling behind. <clears throat> uh, quickly about biophotonics. So light is a very versatile probing radiation. Uh, it has multiple ways in which it, it can create contrast. There's no reason that you cannot combine those different ways. And it can also be a trigger and effector in, in clinical experiment. It's, it's originating in the sample as a very kind of semantic level uh, uh, signal. And ultimately, all biopsy uh, and medical imaging is, is partially optical, because when you look in, at your MRIs and PET scans and so forth, somebody still has to look with the eye and determine what, what that all means. And so uh, somebody, um, uh, we have to worry about the three R's, uh, resolution, relevance, and realism. And realism, of course, is can, can something new be done while, while we are still around? <clears throat> so uh, Dr. Galloway is telling us that you need a pile of sophisticated high technology to map the molecular inhabitants of the cell. So remember, we would like to map these molecular inhabitants in the body. So you need much more than, than you need just for the cells, and preferably not in the configuration of a pile, but something a little bit more strategic. And I'm going to talk about the strategy part of this. So let's start with the center that um, Sebastian mentioned. So I had the singular good fortune of, of leading this national science and technology that encompassed nine departments at Carnegie Mellon in the 90s. And what we developed uh, was uh, an approach to microscopy in which you roboticized the microscope and allowed it to look at the cells that were still key kept cozy and thinking that they are still in the body and engaging in cellular type activities such as wound healing and cellular division and so forth. But look at them in four, five, six different ways so that you capture as much as possible of the essence of what is happening. And uh, we published quite extensively on this. We were able to look at uh, things like uh, 
nano uh, Newton level forces involved in cell division. This is work, beautiful work by, by um, Kevin uh, Burton, who is still with us after all these years. And uh, we use the confocal first to do uh, uh, dynamic and, and quantitative things. And so all in all, it was very rewarding for molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. But it became clear that we would like to first extend the tools that we are using in all possible directions that made sense. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides. And then take all of that was learned and try to apply it to actually bettering uh, the human condition by bringing it to the clinic. So, uh, one thing you can do is you can start looking at the cellular components and see what they contribute to various cellular activities. For that, you need to separate them by, let's call it color, but by wavelengths. And at some point, uh, regular microscopy allows you to look maybe at three, four things. But by the time you want to get greedy and look at six, seven, eight things, you need something different, which we, we uh, took it to be uh, hyperspectral uh, imaging. And uh, this, this was actually uh, uh, very well uh, uh, regarded by, by uh, both uh, reviewers of papers and, and by the Smithsonian uh, people. At this point, we were able to look at uh, five different cellular components uh, in cells that were engaging in, in wound healing. Uh, another direction is obviously to go into preclinical uh, models and uh, eventually clinical. And we developed a 3D method called, that we called, because they're already CAT scans and PET scans, we called, called it DOC scans, the, the digital uh, optical goniometry. And finally, uh, try to improve on, on um, microscopy. My, the microscope is an icon of the sciences, but its resolution is limited by very well understood, well defined physics. So therefore, this was early on, uh, there were no super resolution methods at the time, and uh, it was becoming clear that you need to manipulate the point spread function in order to get the additional resolution that you would ideally want out of your microscope. So we introduced the first of these methods. Uh, it was published uh, 25 years ago, and uh, it allowed us to in enhance the axial resolution of microscopy by almost two orders of magnitude. <clears throat> so there has been, uh, in our lab, recent follow-up on this, so I'm going to describe that very, very quickly. So <clears throat> the way that you can get around the physics that governs the resolution in microscopy is to basically put the light only in certain places. And this can be done in multiple different ways. As I said, engineering the point spread function. And uh, the one way that we uh, uh, did is that you take the light that is illuminating the sample and split it uh, it's a laser light, and make it interfere with itself at the specimen, which creates fringes, vertical fringes of interference. And you can move those fringes by just changing the phase of the interferometer. So with that, you can move the fringes. If you think about the, the focal position of the microscope as the coarse uh, ruler, rulings on a ruler, you can in, in, introduce the fine rulings just by changing the phase of that interferometric uh, set of fringes. So it turns out that you can go from typically one micron resolution in the axial domain, which you get in normal microscopy, or half a micron in confocal and, and two photon, you can go all the way down to a couple of nanometers in, in resolution by just moving those, those fringes. And uh, we did that. Hmm. Not sure why this. Ah. That's why it does. OK. So we developed this method that we call standing wave microscopy, because the fringe pattern is, is, is a standing wave pattern. And we were able to get, uh, for instance, the two sets of uh, delicate fibers in the cell, actin fibers, are separated by 35 nanometers here. And they are very easy to see separately. And so we went all the way down to uh, about 6 nanometer uh, resolution. The simplest way to do this is not even to take the laser beam and, sep and separate it and interfere with itself, but rather take a single laser beam, go, have it go through the specimen, put a mirror on top of the specimen, have it hit the mirror and come back on itself, which introduces these interference fringes uh, in standing wave. And so that was the cheapest, simplest implementation of, of standing wave. But subsequently, it gave uh, Dr. Andreas Novacek uh, in, in our labs an idea that um, 
maybe this can be moved into all three dimensions. And we were trying to do it at the time, but it turns out that the computational power was really not available even from a Cray supercomputer at the time. It, by the way, in the meantime, of course, the field of super resolution microscopy has evolved tremendously and extraordinarily smart and, and beautiful things have been done, culminating in, in three uh, of our colleagues getting Nobel Prizes for their particular approach, which is very nice physics. Uh, we were looking for something a little bit more uh, practical and simple, and so uh, Dr. Novacek proposed that instead of that mirror, if you can put in, uh, if you can put in a holographic grating, ideally a, a custom holographic grating, then the, the fringes would not just go in one direction, but they will go in all directions, and then you would just move that, that grating, and you would be able to cover all three-dimensional space with very delicately uh, uh, structured, uh, spatially structured light. The problem is that, of course, you have to put then the 3D picture back together. So you do have super resolution, but how do you know what's where? And, and so 25 years ago, that was not possible. Today, you can just buy some graphics uh, processors and put them uh, in your computer and, and have much more than the equivalent of a supercomputer in 1993. So we uh, are developing this method. This is the schematics. I'm not going to dwell too much because I have a whole lot more to tell you about. But uh, just to close the microscopy part of, 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 of this talk, uh, we uh, are starting to uh, apply this uh, and plan to apply this to some very, very specific clinically relevant things, including a, a very exciting uh, joint project with uh, Professor Waxman Hoju here that uh, I'm hoping that he can tell you about, but it's pertaining to Alzheimer's and exosomes. <clears throat> okay, so let's move in another dimension that can be improved, which is the spectral uh, uh, quality of, of the light going into the sample and coming out of, of the sample. There are many, many ways of doing uh, uh, spectral selection for light, and they are listed uh, here, and they are not even all of them. Okay, so we have pretty much every one of these in our labs, but we got excited about acoustic tunable filters because they have no moving parts and they are really sophisticated uh, uh, instruments that are flying on some of the better satellites. And uh, so we looked at what are their features and how can they be improved so that they can be used for high resolution uh, imaging. And uh, so this illustrates how, how the spectral selection is done, but uh, acoustic optic thermal filters are some of the devices by which you can do the spectral acquisition in a way that we prefer, which is so-called um, band sequential. Uh, they replace, uh, in microscopy and, and biomedical imaging, they replace uh, interference filters, mechanical shutters, and neutral density filters. It's actually very nice physics behind it. I, I don't have time to go into it, but it's photon-phonon interactions in the crystal. You, pr you, you put ultrasound uh, with electrodes onto the crystal, and it, it creates a propagating ultrasound wave, which in certain crystals that have the right properties, it creates a virtual diffraction grating. Therefore, the white light coming in is diffracted, and you control by just electronically uh, tuning the radio frequency, you control the, the frequency therefore the, the wavelengths of the light, you can control the timing and you can control the, uh, the intensity because how, how much light goes through. So it could be functioning as a microsecond uh, uh, level shutter. It, con it controls pretty much all the features of light that you would like to control. And we figured out uh, what were some of the limitations of these and, and published on it. And uh, so basically we were able to make them good enough for microscopic, uh, sup uh, microscopic um, diffracted limited, diffraction limited uh, spatial resolution uh, imaging. And that's uh, the components of a cell after separation by spectral uh, characterization through acoustic uh, tunable filters. You can see, for instance, here that there's a, there's a doublet here that gets resolved. Uh, because uh, the resolution is uh, very high. Uh, okay, so what do you do in a spectral imaging experiment? Well, you can look at anything that could be as small as a subcellular organelle, or you can be a continent. And in that image, at every pixel, you can get a complete spectral signature. So that obviously is quantitatively different from whatever color cameras are doing, in which are lumping a lot of information into three channels. So this much more delicate signature allows you to separate something which is just barely different from something else and say this is A, this is B. Okay? So that's a very uh, desirable general capability. So if you can put 
uh, acoustic optic thermal filters on both the emission side and the excitation side of a microscope, then you can do uh, quite a versatile uh, set of microscopy uh, experiments with hyperspectral resolution. Uh, but I should say that you can replace the microscope with anything that you prefer. It could be an endoscope, it could be an ophthalmoscope, it could be any optical instrument that could benefit from the additional discrimination ability of hyperspectral uh, imaging. So we, are, we applied this to many things. Uh, we started with uh, cytopathology. This is pap smears. I'm not going to dwell on it because it's mostly, mostly published, but you can get extremely high performance by using uh, spectral segmentation of the images, as you can see here. And today, this work is done really by uh, cytotechnologists who are subjective, get tired, and, and certainly their performance is not great overall. But in the second uh, four hours of their eight-hour shift, it gets even worse. So sp hyperspectral uh, uh, replacement uh, of, of their determinations is very desirable. And we got extremely high uh, 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 specificity and sensitivity with this. You can also do histopathology. And again, we publish quite a bit on this, but the point is that we can do, by hyperspectral uh, segmentation, we can do as well as some of the really much more uh, uh, specialized methods such as immunohistochemistry does, but without having to do the extra staining and the extra steps. So this was very reproducible. This is a breast cancer uh, example. Uh, we also worked on uh, prostate cancer, in which it was easy to see whether this layer of cells is present or not. So, uh, and then we applied it eventually to what we really uh, were working on very intensely, which is melanoma. I'm going to come back to that uh, in the clinical part of, of, of the talk. Uh, eventually, you can apply it to just about anything. This particular thing here is, is wound healing, and you can characterize uh, very quantitatively what is happening. And you can even apply it uh, to in vivo cases, all the way on, on, on the right. And uh, overall, it, it just allows you to better understand what's happening in your specimen and characterize it uh, quantitatively. So let's turn our attention to cancer still in the realm of, of cellular uh, approaches. Uh, we don't take our cues from uh, uh, Fortune magazine, but this was to this day the most downloaded paper in the history of Fortune magazine. And it was a couple of years ago. And this entitled by a cancer survivor, why we are losing the war on cancer. So uh, paraphrasing, it's a very complex disease. Mouse models and animal models have been disappointing. And in humans, early detection is the only thing that kind of works, except for lung cancer. And therefore, we might need to regroup and look at some possibly different approaches. So here's one. Uh, in a moment of enthusiasm, we, we call it multi-parameter uh, 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 proteomics, uh, you can start asking questions of, the, of this kind. Uh, you can read faster than I can talk, but basically, uh, you know, are the cellular components present in different cells at different times or in the same cell? What are they doing? How are they interacting with each other? All of the other methods that are currently used, biochemical, molecular, biological, they are all homogenizing the sample, and these kind of questions cannot be asked. So I hope that nobody here is particularly fond of Microarrays. Is there anybody working on microarrays? Because I'm going to say something pretty bad about them. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. They have limitations. Okay, so when I saw the first microarray that was published by Affymetrics, it was in Science Magazine, I knew that I've seen a picture like this before. And this was in Gulliver's Travels. And, and it was, a, you know, Swift being a, being a, a very acerbic uh, parodist, uh, he was taking on the royal institution and it was describing at the Grand Academy of Lagado this impossible uh, illogical project. And this was one of them. And it was called the literary engine. And what it was is that there were 24 students in a class and a, and a professor. And 20 students were basically putting all the words on little, little uh, wooden tablets and with strings. And they would pull, pull them. And then the sequence was noted down by the other four students and piled in the corner of the classroom. A huge pile, all of the combinations. And the visitor, uh, Gulliver, was told that all of the answers to everything that we seek is in that pile. But we just have to be able to extract it. And so they were not able. And to this day, by, by microarrays, we, not immediately is it clear what the microarray is telling you. Uh, like here. <coughs> so why perform 
multiple measurements per cell because the, the patterns of intracellular changes are actually not only telling you where you are at with the specimen that you extracted from the, from the patient, but it also tells you the entire fossil history of how you got there. And that is really a very precious capability. So we looked, for instance, uh, with uh, Dr. Shackney, we looked at kind of the main players in breast cancer. And this is on the same cells we were able to label with different uh, fluorescent uh, labels, uh, HER2 new, uh, uh, cycling D, uh, the nuclei, and, and so forth, to get a much more complete picture. And as you can see, there's a, there's a multiplexing effect. So one seven color panel contains uh, as much information as 210 four color panels. And so you would like to know particularly for, for the very desirable personalized treatment, you would like to know as much as possible about the, the cancer that came out of that patient, not a general kind of statistically driven approach. And so we were able, so we call this, as I said, multiplexed intracellular uh, proteomics. This is still not published uh, because we were up to 10 colors, which you need hyperspectral imaging to do. But we were hoping to, to get to 18, and there's nothing magical about 18 other than the fact that the world record, as far as we know, is 17 with flow cytometry. And it was done at the NIH a couple of years ago, and uh, multiple physicists need to be in the room and hold hands and chant, but, but 17. 17 is the target. <clears throat> and so I'm not going to dwell on this because I have much more to tell you about. So if you take the same kind of approach, not necessarily with seven colors and so forth, but with confocal and, and fluorescence and, and other good optical methods with microscopy. Uh, this was work done at uh, Cedar sinai with uh, uh, Dr. Black's and Dr. Uh, John Yu's uh, group. Uh, we were able, pretty much simultaneously with a group in Toronto, to publish for the first time in, in uh, uh, a cancer journal on uh, cancer stem cells. These are really scary cells that can regenerate, in, in animal models, you can regenerate both the regular cells in the, in the brain, but also the glioblastomas. And uh, since then, obviously, there has been a lot of progress in the field, but basically both uh, pharma and others will tell you that these are the, the real cells that make cancers come back and, and be such a bad uh, scenario. So the various treatments get rid of 99% of the cancers, but if these guys are still around, these stem cells, they can recreate any of the, any of the bad um, uh, tracks. Um, OK, so let's move on now to some animal work. So before tackling things like cancer in animals and preclinical models, we always try to start with something a little bit simpler that we understand better. This is one example. Again, I'm not going to dwell on the specifics, but there's a children's uh, congenital disease called Hirschsprung's disease. The colon of the newborns are, is basically not fully innervated. That, starting at a certain point, it's aganglionic, and therefore the proper functioning of the colon is, is impeded. And if you don't intervene, the, the, the babies basically would die. In, in, a, in a week or two. And, and so therefore, uh, uh, people discovered that this is uh, congenital and therefore intervention is needed. In the old days, they used to do open surgery, which is terrible, as you can imagine. And the only improvement on that in the last couple of years has been that now they do it endoscopically. But still coming in endoscopically, you have to determine where to cut so that the part that is not functional is, is taken out and then the whole system is reconnected. So that cutting has been done based on eyeballing, basically, and uh, the better uh, pediatric surgeons will tell you that. One of those uh, surgeons uh, came to us, Dr. Uh, Frickman, and uh, we did first uh, animal experiments on Hirschsprung's disease, and then he obtained an IRB to do also uh, 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 trials on, on babies at the Children's Hospital in, in Los Angeles. And all we are doing is reflectance spectral imaging to try to characterize that tissue and see, for instance, on the right, uh, on that tissue, uh, where to, where to cut because by first principles, if you cut too much, it's not good. If you cut too little, it's, it's certainly not good. And so um, we were able to, by spectral uh, uh, segmentation, to find this transitional region that you may see in blue here. And then obviously, this is the bad, the bad part. So the reason that I'm showing this is that we did take full spectral measurements, but it turns out that f ultimately only, you only need three wavelengths. But you don't know which those three wavelengths are until you do the full spectral measurement. So we, we have found that actually if you take the ratio at 609 nanometers bet bet between the intensities, you can get extremely high sensitivity and specificity uh, uh, determination of where you need to do the surgical intervention. So the topological guidance. Uh, <clears throat> This is very rapid, and uh, uh, the transition zone is making 
uh, is highlighted. It's also published, so I'm not going to dwell on it. So let's move to cancer. So we were able to use an animal model of cancer, a resident, a surgical resident who is now a, a big time cancer surgeon, uh, Alice Chung, uh, was, was driving this, this work. So we were inducing uh, cancers in, in rats. These were human cancer cell lines that were being injected, and they would come up in approximately a week. We did not want to look when it's a clear cancer that you can see with the naked eye. We wanted to look at the earliest possible time and see whether with no contrast agent, which also is going to be a motif in, in what I'm telling you about, whether with no contrast agent, and that's verified by, by histopathology, whether we can see uh, cancers in, in these in this animals. And so we looked at uh, a total of uh, 2,800 images, and uh, it, this was seven-day tumors. And we were able to, with very high sensitivity and specificity, uh, 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 find these tumors. Uh, I should say also that we used six different uh, image analysis uh, methods to look at the spectral data sets. And for reasons that are still uh, not 100% clear, certain methods were better than others. So in this particular case, Mahalanobis distances was better than Euclidean distances or principal components or even support vector machines. And so in this particular case, that was the way to, that was the way to go. Okay, so it also became clear that if you want to tackle something complicated like cancer, you may want to not look in just one way, but look in multiple different ways. So we started with uh, Jay Huang, who was originally a, a graduate student from USC, and then he stayed on as a, as a postdoc and uh, drove uh, uh, the interface between our project and, and uh, Caltech. Uh, to uh, develop a small a animal imaging system that is multi-mode imaging. Uh, there are multiple reasons why you would want to do uh, multi-mode small animal imaging. Uh, you can uh, distinguish multiple targets and uh, you can classify better. So we built a system in which there were seven different ways in which you can look at your animal uh, uh, models of disease. Uh, some of them are very easy to, to understand, like uh, spectral and fluorescence, but also lifetime of fluorescence, luminescence, 3D fluorescence, and even confocal. And so uh, this is the system uh, schematically, and the reason that you want to bother putting all these methods in is that each is better at something. So spectral is extremely good at uh, quantitation, uh, uh, intravital confocal gives you endoscopic high resolution, uh, kinetics are best monitored with single wavelength, single photon fluorescence, and, and so on. So this is the system schematic. Uh, uh, William Blake once said that you never know what is enough until you know what is mo more than enough. So we had seven lasers in the system. It's not likely that the hospital or even a, a, another research lab will go into that sort of trouble. But again, you want to learn more so that you can then refine it, particularly for the clinic, in what are the two methods or three methods that you would like to capture. So this thing was able to do seven. And this is the, um, this is the layout. And this is it in real life. Uh, here on the left, this is a commercial device that we added. So this was the confocal imaging. It's a beautiful uh, system that was developed by a French company called Mauna Kea Technologies. And we were able to do significantly better in terms of uh, contrast than, than the best, most expensive commercial system, but which only had one uh, mode of imaging. And we published quite a bit on it, so I'm not, not going to uh, give you too many examples, just three very quick ones. This one with uh, Dr. Lyubimova and her group, uh, it's a nano construct in which you basically have this drug that you are constructing. Uh, it has a tracking moiety, which is fluorescent, and you can track it uh, through the body of the animal, uh, particularly if it's more towards the red and near-infrared. Uh, it also has some binding moieties that will make sure that the targeting is pretty specific, and then it has some destructive uh, elements to it, which enables you to basically kill the tumors that it is con connecting to. So you can see uh, kinetically how the signal is rising. Uh, this is a tumor that we induced in mice, and it's confirmed by histopathology and uh, uh, fluorescence here. <clears throat> the second application, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to, to dwell on this. We, uh, this is work on corals. This is a family of uh, very interesting uh, molecules that were developed uh, in a collaboration between the Technion and, and the Caltech uh, by, by um, Zev Gross and, and uh, Harry Gray's group. And uh, these molecules are able to function as chemotherapy agents, but then it turns out that if you uh, 
do certain additional things, they would function as multi-pronged chemotherapy agents. For instance, they also have a pretty strong photodynamic effect. They can kill the cancer cells in at least three different ways. And again, we publish quite a bit on it. But in order to track them in the early going, you need a combination of methods. And for instance, here you can see how much deeper you can penetrate with two photons versus one photon. We also did lifetime of fluorescence and spectral segmentation to see where the, the molecules would go and, and attack, attack the tumor. And uh, you can see, for instance, that the segmentation is both by spectral and fluorescence lifetime is pretty, pretty clear, uh, much more so than in just taking pictures of the, of the animal's uh, 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 organs. And then ultimately, you can do a little bit better than that. And what you do is you take any of your favorite chemotherapy agents, either because they're already around and approved, even for human use, like doxorubicin, or these corals, and you can attach them to something that targets extremely well. So this is in collaboration with Dr. Lali Medina Kawe at, at, at um, Cedar sinai They developed a very, very uh, uh, specific targeting uh, uh, agent uh, molecule uh, that was developed originally for uh, gene therapy. And it didn't work quite that well in gene therapy, but if you take it and attach doxorubicin to it, for instance, you can use concentrations as little as 20 to 100 times less than the normal levels of doxorubicin and get the same effect. So here you can see that uh, you have basically a, a, a killing of the, of the tumor with this targeted doxorubicin. Now, if we also used it with the corals and it was very nice uh, results in terms of eff efficacy of, of killing cancer. So the lower doses obviously prevent all of the bad if side effects of chemo and, and, and so forth. So this is a, a, an exciting way of proceeding. And I don't think that uh, without the optical methods, you could have figured out this sort of things from uh, other types of biomedical imaging, which is more accepted in, in the clinic. We, this, these are just some of the publications. So I'm not, not going to go into more details. OK. so. We would like to do first preclinical and then clinical work, but ideally without using any contrast agents. So one way to go about that is to have your effector molecules, such as the corals, also be your contrast agents. So you don't need to rely on the, on the availability and the targeting ability and so forth of contrast agents, but you just rely on the molecules that you're using anyway to get rid of the cancer. The other way to, to go about this, which is a little bit more difficult, is to just use intrinsic signatures of the body. And for that, I would say, generally speaking, you need better optical technologies. So again, starting with something that is not quite as complicated as cancer, uh, we were looking at, uh, at the necks of, of rats being imaged for thyroid and pa parathyroid. And uh, Jihoon Jong in, in our labs developed a, a rather sophisticated spectral uh, analysis program to, to, to look at non-stained tissue. And so if you just look at it with the naked eye, you can't tell what's what. If you look at it with regular spectral segmentation, it's very tough to see what is going on, where's the par parathyroid, where's the thyroid, where's muscle. But as you start getting a little bit more sophisticated with the analysis, you can actually separate into, into different channels the various interesting components. And then you can remap them depending on what you're interested in. If you're interested in what happens to, let's say, a cancer, you can highlight that. If you're interested in what happens uh, in terms of the vascularity, you can, you can highlight that. And so this so-called florid picture on the right ended up on a cover, cover of, a, of a book that we did a couple of years ago with, with Jim Fujimoto. <clears throat> So let's take a, a two minute, three minute detour to talk about stem cells because everybody likes stem cells. They are a very exciting part of regenerative medicine in general. And uh, stem cells in principle are wonderful. Uh, but uh, what is kind of an unstated assumption is that once you put these magical uh, cells into the body in order to achieve some clinical outcome, all of the things that you hope to happen happen and none of the things that uh, you don't want to happen happen. And that's a nice assumption, but you would like to rather, uh, you would prefer to see it. And so, uh, with apologies to Monsieur Magritte, uh, just like uh, this is not a pipe uh, and this is not a, a, a drug, uh, this is not a panacea, the stem cells. But if you can track them in the body, then maybe you can start saying something about the mechanism of action. So it's just one slide here because it summarizes years of work but, uh, and I'll try to point. So this is mostly with Dr. Askenazi. We were able to label stem cells and inject them into animals, uh, into, into the femurs 
uh, through circulation, they made it into the femurs of, um, uh, uh, of mice, and they were uh, in embedding and grafting into the, into the tissue there. And we even came up with some methods by which, uh, through fluorescence resonance energy transfer, up to three weeks after the injection, we can see them in vivo, and we can also tell the live ones from the, from the dead ones. This is done with PKH dyes and, and um, uh, first energy, energy transfer. If you are able to do this sort of tracking, uh, you can start putting together a story of what happens in terms of sequence as the hematopoietic stem cells go about their work in, in, the, in the bone marrow. And so uh, this kind of work is now, done now at, at uh, Mass General uh, and the Wellman Labs, and, and they have done fantastic uh, enhancements to, to, to the approach, and, and they can monitor stem cells live uh, very convincingly. Uh, you can also look at dendritic cells, which are kind of the clean up uh, immunological cells of the body, and that's pretty exciting. I don't have time to tell you this story, but basically the stem cells, uh, the dendritic cells thought that the, the marker arrow that we put just to find the locus where we injected them, it's something that is deleterious to the animal, so they were basically eating it up while we were going and taking a 10 minute break. And so that was interesting to see that uh, chemistry triggers the, the, the dendritic cells. <clears throat> So you can put together the topology and you can put together the, the mechanism. Okay, so let's move on to neuroimaging. Uh, I don't know whether you recognize this gentleman. He used to be the editor-in-chief of Science Magazine. He's a really illustrious uh, neuroscientist, uh, Floyd Bloom. And he tells us that uh, the, the gain in brain lies mainly in the stain. So he's not happy with the level of progress and the kind of progress that is being made. The reason that that sounds like something that you something familiar is because of this. Uh, the original quote is the rain in space stays mainly in, in, in the plane, and that's what happens actually by hyperspectral imaging when the rain in space stays mainly in the plane, the massive flooding is, is, is induced. And uh, I would say that uh, the stain in brain lies mainly because it's plain. And don't hold me to it. Don't, don't Google Dr. Dalisa, it's just my name transposed. It was very late on a flight. Uh, apologies. but. Science is driven by ideas, and paradigm shifts are sometimes uh, uh, driven by direct improvements in technology. This is what Peter Doherty is telling us. So what would be better? Well, better molecular specificity would be better, better functional imaging, better speed, and better places and ways to look. So I'm going to illustrate not the top one, because that was done extremely impressively by people like Roger Chen and Nobel Prizes were given out. I'm going to look quickly at the other three. So the first one, speed. With the acoustic turnover filters, remember, there's no moving parts. Therefore, you can have very, very fast imaging. So we were able to look at sub-millisecond temporal resolution imaging at a neuromuscular junction and look at what is happening to the calcium domains that are firing upon uh, neural excitation. And with this uh, micro microscope that had both the temporal and the spectral uh, acquisition uh, driven by acoustic turnover filters, we were able to look at sub-millisecond scale at, at the very primary events. And think about it, in typical neurosciences to this day, the, the, the standard for speed is video rate. By the, time, by the time the first video frame comes around, everything is delocalized. So if you want to look at discrete events, you better have resolution of the order of a millisecond or better. So we were able to, to have that, and you can see here that, that uh, at this neuromuscular junction, even one millisecond makes a difference in terms of how things look like. And if you fire consecutively uh, on, on that neuromuscular junction, you can see that on every firing, a different set of domains comes on, which was totally the opposite of what the, the dogma was in the, in the field at the time. And so therefore, it made it a little bit more difficult to publish. Uh, but it makes sense biologically, because what you want is, is, is some redundancy, so that if there's some sort of uh, functional uh, or, or structural damage, that you would still have a reasonably functional uh, neuromuscular junction. And so uh, this had a lot of modeling also that went into an appendix that was done with the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. And uh, you know they made us jump through hoops to, to publish this. But speed uh, was a very good thing to add to the capabilities. OK, uh, still with an acoustic uh, uh, microscope in which uh, you can also do 
uh, spectral and temporal control, uh, we were looking in living animals in the brain at two things, oxygen saturation of hemoglobin and oxygen tension. Oxygen saturation of hemoglobin is pretty easy to understand. So basically, in the spectrum, in between 500 and 600, and then again around 800, there's very clear spectral changes upon change in oxygenation from oxygenated to deoxygenated. So we could map uh, in the brain of a living animal uh, and tell arteries and veins uh, apart and have the animal breathe different levels of oxygen, <laughs> normoxic, hypoxic, and hyperoxic, and see how the, how the changes are, are induced. What is much more difficult to do is to look at oxygen tension. So most current experimentation that will tell you that they measure oxygen tension, they actually measure oxy oxygen saturation and assume that the two are connected by a sigmoidal curve that never changes. It turns out that it changes even from strain of mice to other strain of mice. But we were able to map both of those in the time frame of about a second or two and see the changes in oxygen tension as well as oxygen saturation. The way that this is done is by lifetime of phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is quenched by oxygen. So uh, there was beautiful work done mostly at the University of uh, Pennsylvania and, and Philadelphia developing these this probes uh, that allowed you to uh, go from uh, full oxygen to, to, to practically zero oxygen by changing phosphorescence lifetime from uh, two, 200 microseconds to two milliseconds. So with the speed of the AOTFs, we were able to map those and come up with, with maps, like, maps like this. OK, so having covered that, uh, I hope I can go on a little bit. Because I, I have a lot, I have a lot of slides. I'll, I'll, start, I'll start skipping some, but how, how, how do we try to bring all of this to the clinic, okay? So uh, we would like to bring advanced biomedical imaging to the clinic. So we have a strategy, identify major needs, and try to apply the best things that we have found to, to it. But the main methodological point I'd like to make is that our means should match our tasks, unlike here. And, and the other conclusion is that strategy is even more important than technology as illustrated here. So I told you about some of the technologies that are published. Let's take on some difficult problems. Melanoma, beta endoscopy, oxygenation imaging for things like burns and, and wounds and such, and early detection of Alzheimer's. Uh, we developed a device called SkinSpect that we apply to originally to, to uh, early detection of melanoma, in which case the clinical scenario is very pleasant. It's 99% cure. If you find it late, it's very low percentage of, of, of cure. Uh, main advantage is, is that we are trying to map everything that is of relevance in the skin in 3D quantitatively, even if they sit on top of each other, which, which they do, like melanin and oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and collagen, as opposed to other systems in the literature in which they are basically trying to develop a, a expert system and only be able to look at melanoma. And even with melanoma, the more data you get, the worse the system performance gets. In our case, we build libraries, we build better understanding, so therefore the better the system uh, performance gets. Uh, this was early work on 12 uh, uh, volunteers, only with spectral imaging. And we were able to find in 12 out of 12 very early melanoma arising in those moles that were going to be removed anyway. This was done in, in, in Pittsburgh. And I'm not going to dwell too much on it. Uh, but I sh I'll show you one particularly unpleasant example in which this, this patient uh, had an ugly mole. He went to a community hospital and they removed it by punch biopsy. And a couple of months later, uh, the, mole started the mole started growing again, the pigmented nevus, and early melanoma was growing in it. And so it would be nice to be able to always find what needs to, to come off and how much uh, spatially. Uh, oops. So uh, a very brief detour into risk mitigation. I don't know whether you know, but in the United States at least, uh, medical errors have jumped to number three in cause of death. So it's cancer, cardiovascular, medical errors. It's, it's, it's staggering and probably underreported. So if you look at other fields of human endeavor where there's risk, this is equivalent to five large planes falling out of the sky every day. So maybe other fields of human endeavor have figured out a few things about risk mitigation. So we, I started reading this literature and found out of all the models, I found one that I liked. It's by a British gentleman, probably a curmudgeon that uh, 
is, believe it or not, his name is Dr. Reason. So Dr. Reason says, OK, here's a hazard, here's you. You are trying to do something about it, so therefore you're interposing something between the hazard and yourself. However, we are human, everything we do is flawed, so therefore what you're interposing is like a slice of Swiss cheese, it has holes in it, and the bad thing can hit you through the holes. So what's the most logical thing to do? Put a couple of slices of cheese because the holes don't align. So that to us is, a, is basically saying do multi-mode imaging, right? So here's current melanoma detection, and you can hit the patient in multiple different ways. If you stack the slices, it's less likely that you're going to miss, miss something. So, we started building this device. It's, it's a handheld with a cart uh, with full spectral capabilities, but with several other methods that we put on it. Uh, polarization control, autofluorescence. Uh, we had iterations. The more we go, the more the system gets better and, and, and slimmer. Acquisition went all the way down to about a second. Um, uh, you get this spectral set with this, with this handheld. Uh, this is how the whole thing looks like. We have LEDs also to excite autofluorescence. So you get basically in a typical measurement, you hover over the item of interest. In this case, in for melanoma, it's a mole. And you basically get about 100 plus images, actually 106 images. And of course, you have to process them. And polarization is important because you don't want to look at the right light that just gets specularly reflected that has, contains no information. So this is work uh, mostly by uh, Dr. Fartash Vasefi, who is actually in the audience here, and he has been uh, working with, uh, with me for a number of years. Uh, it's published in actually multiple, multiple papers. I'm not going to dwell on the details, but basically you can look at either darker things than the skin, such as moles, nevi, or psoriasis, or anything else, and you can map quantitatively these various components of the skin that are sitting on top of each other and under the surface. So the human eye cannot penetrate, the human eye cannot go into the near infrared, so it's useful. And then you find out that there's a lot of uh, data in the literature that basically, because they didn't have all of the wavelengths necessary to do the discrimination, they're coming to their own conclusions because the melanoma, uh, the, the melanin uh, images are affected by the presence of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and the other way around. And so we uh, developed a method by which a correction can be induced. So you can see that if you don't do the correction spectrally, there's very high correlation between the uh, hemoglobin and, and uh, oxygenation and, and melanin. But once you do the correction, there's practically no correlation whatsoever. Therefore, you are confident you are, you are, you are mapping all of them. Uh, we have a couple of uh, very nice clinical collaborations at U University of California, Irvine, and at Memorial Sloan Kettering. The beauty of these places is that they have pretty much every other method known to man to look at the skin. So therefore, we can always compare our results with not only histopathology, but also other methods, such as in this case, uh, 3D histopathology done by confocal microscopy at, at uh, Sloan Kettering. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a pretty ugly uh, melanoma. Uh, you can see that you can map both superficial melanin and deep melanin with, with our method. And we, you can uh, deduce certain things such as the so-called Breslau thickness, which is very indicative of the evolution of the disease and what stage uh, the melanoma is. Uh, you can tell melanoma from dysplastic nevi, from lentigo simplex, and from uh, compound uh, dysplastic nevi just by, by uh, not just imaging, but quantitating that, that imaging on, on, on the right hand side. Uh, as I said, we have lots of correlated measurements, as shown here. And of course, you can use it for anything else in the skin, such as basal cell and, and squamous cell carcinoma, which are, have much higher incidence than melanoma. They are not the killers that melanoma is. But the way that they are done today by iterative uh, hacking called uh, most microscopic surgery is not the best way to do it. So if you can outline, put a dotted line around where you would need to cut, especially because these things are mostly on, on, on the face, uh, you can have a much better image-guided intervention, and possibly you can do it uh, uh, by robotic approaches. You can also use it for cosmetic purposes. I didn't bring slides about that, but you can tell that you can look at anything before and after and see how well anything works. You can use it for burns. You can use it for wounds. You can use it for things of that sort. Uh, let's move to endoscopy. Uh, the best places, by the way, to look optically are first outside of the body, which is the skin, then at the tip of an endoscope, and then in the eye. So let's move to endoscopy. So uh, can you build a hyperspectral endoscope? Uh, and basically, as you go around and do your endoscopy, know what to touch and what not to touch, know what to remove and what not to remove. There was an early paper 
in 2000 by a Harvard MIT collaboration led by uh, Vadim Bachman. This was with uh, Dr. Feld, uh, who unfortunately is not with us anymore, in which they did uh, a spectrally based uh, me scattering uh, detection of GI cancers. And it was a very impressive uh, paper in Nature with a single figure and basically saying, this is cancer, this is not cancer. Based on just the spectral signature, the, f the theory was given by Gustav Mee in December of 1907. And it tells you that if you put light down on something and the light scattered back, basically has spectral oscillations that depend on nothing else but the size of the scatterers, the only scatterers in the, in, in the tissue, in human tissue of note are the nuclei. So if the nuclei are slightly enlarged, as, such as in dysplasia, and certainly as in cancer, much enlarged, you can tell without having that actual resolution, because me scattering is basically able to give you a little uh, elevation map, like maps of, of where the nuclei are enlarged. This one was not done like that. This one, uh, point measurement. So basically, you had to come with your endoscope that actually touched the GI from the inside, the GI tract. and, and have to get multiple points in order to get your, your measurement. The reason I think that this was not followed up on is because the surgeons don't want to have to touch in 100 places or 200 places. So what's logical to do is to pull back and instead of doing it one point at a time, have full hyperspectral imaging of the endoscopic field of view and try to do miscattering in that way. So uh, the theory, as I said, is well understood. Uh, we built a hyperspectral endoscope uh, to look at this sort of scattering. We actually built it as uh, skinny enough that it could fit it into the instrument channel of an existing endoscope, so therefore you don't have to change your procedures. Uh, looked at 62 patients, and basically we saw that it's deployable in the clinic, but that the quality of the results is, is not that great because uh, we didn't have quite the spectral resolution that you need. So these are some of, the, some of the results. That's how the endoscope looks like. So there are two fibers on the ca uh, camera end and three on the, on the tip for excitation. We can get all the data in 250 milliseconds, but here's, here's the main point. If you take something off the shelf, you get the green line on top, very poor spectral resolution. If you get a reasonably good spectral resolution, like, such as with the acoustic optic turbo filters, you can start seeing the os oscillations, but if you can get something such as the spectral technologies that we are developing under Air Force funding and that I'm not going to talk about, uh, you have sub-nanometer resolution, you can start seeing very nicely the, 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 the me-scattering peaks. And with that, you can say how, how big are the nuclei in the region that you're looking at. Another way to go with endoscopy is, remember, I want to connect uh, detection and, and treatment. Uh, another way to do hyperspectral is to do it at every location and do it in a scanning confocal mode. So this was done with uh, Gary Carver in collaboration. And uh, what we built is uh, an endoscope that was spec spectral and sc confocal scanning. You could look at autofluorescence, very high uh, signals, healthy signals. But the point f that we built it for is this. You can decide what it is that you don't want there, such as cancer. And then as you have taken the image by having uh, uh, touched every point, every pixel, you come back with a bigger laser and just fire it over the points that you would like to remove. So this is really surgical intervention. So we showed that it works here for, for um, uh, beads, fluorescent beads, and then for tissue. You can see here that we remove this and we remove this. And again, this was published. <coughs> OK, uh, eventually you can put all your multi-mode modes onto an endoscope. So this was a very uh, fancy endoscope that we ended up building at, at, at Cedar sinai in uh, circa 2008-9. And uh, you start to worry about how are these things going to be deployed in the clinic. Uh, well, you need a new kind of operating room in which you can just roll something in and connect it. So we developed an operating room of the future. Doesn't look like this, unfortunately. but. Conceptually, it looks like this, that anything that has an internet connection can play with anything that is already in, in, the, in the room. OK, quickly now. Uh, the multi-mode uh, approach that we are proposing, and it kind of enhances your capability of determining what's going on in, in the tissue, uh, doesn't need to be methods that are juxtaposed next to each other. It's much better to work with a funnel of methods in which you can kind of, kind of look, then look, then really look, and then for diagnostic purposes, in very few selected places, you can look with the expensive, difficult methods to deploy. I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but it's kind of fun. It's a Hieronymus Bosch that hangs in the Prado, and it's the only place where I found a 
funnel approach to it. This is actually called the stone of dementia. So I'm coming to Alzheimer in a second here. Okay, so let's talk about Alzheimer's just, just for, to end. Uh, the health crisis of our generation, uh, no question. Uh, in, by, by the baby boomers uh, growing up uh, and getting old, uh, in a few years it will become totally uh, bankruptcy inducing for the health system. Uh, today, the expenditures are $259 billion just in the US per year, and another about $250 billion for the caregiving by family and, and, and others. So uh, if you look here, this is, this is really shocking. Uh, out of all the major diseases, I don't know whether you can read this, but it has the, the usual suspects, you know, everything, AIDS, breast cancer, and so forth, all on the decline in terms of mortality. Alzheimer shot up uh, significantly, and even more so, the year after this statistic was, was given. So, uh, early detection would be, would be best, uh, as shown here. Uh, we know this for many years. Uh, we aim to leverage what we have learned in order to do this early detection. This is too verbose, I'm not going to take you through it, but basically you would like to, in order to do something cogent, you need to understand it. To understand it, you need to make a ment mental picture of it. What's easier for the mental picture than making an actual picture? So imaging is highly recommended, and that imaging better be non-invasive, fast, dynamic, quantitative, do it on the right things, with the right places, and, and also non, non, um, uh, not requiring uh, contrast agents. So for Alzheimer's disease, we, uh, more than half of, of all academic research focuses on non-primary uh, uh, pathologies. Most of academic research is in animals. All clinical research is in late stage disease, at which point I don't think that much help can be given. So there are many problems with, with current approaches. We think that we improved on some of that by basically looking in the eye. The retina is neural tissue. We feel that it's reflective of what's going on in the brain, but it's much more accessible to, to um, optical imaging. So uh, I th we think that that was the way to go, but it required a biomarker. So very much towards the end of this, I want to show you what you can do uh, without a biomarker. So, uh, so our goal is not to continue bringing uh, uh, a knife to a gunfight, uh, uh, such as current approaches, but do the opposite of that. And you probably all know this scene, so I'm not going to play it. <clears throat> okay, so. Ideally, uh, you want to look 15 to 20 years before you see any cognitive decay symptoms. And the only way to do that, we feel, is in the retina with optical imaging. This was a paper that we published a few years ago, and it was a first step towards that goal. This was done in animal models of uh, mutant mice that got very quickly uh, the rise of Alzheimer in, in, in them, and also on some uh, human archival uh, tissues. And uh, it was done optically. Uh, you can see that in the mutants, you have the appearance of amyloid plaques. These, these are the prim a primary pathology. It doesn't even matter whether you believe in the amyloid hypothesis. It doesn't need to be causative pathology. It just has to be early pathology. So the same way that if you want to find an accident on the road is probably what the people are standing around. They didn't cause the accident, but that's probably what the accident is. Uh, so we can, we can confirm that with uh, multiple different controls by, by antibodies and so forth that you can see actual plaques. Uh, you can actually do something about them with some Im immune treatments, and also you can look in living animals. This was the first time that this was ever done, and we can see the plaques. We could see the plaques in living animals. And uh, also in patients who had definite Alzheimer, and even in patients that had suspected Alzheimer's, and obviously less plaques, but still. And you could, you could match to the temporal evolution. It's not a large study. Uh, we didn't have the resources to do a large study. But instead of talking about the large study, let's talk about what could be done that would, in my opinion, enhance this. Let's look not with contrast agents that you add in, because you don't know how well they can target, and you don't know how well you can image them. Uh, this was a good contrast agent called curcumin. We want to do it without contrast agents. It turns out that the primary pathology uh, uh, molecules, the uh, amyloid plaques, have their own fluorescence, autofluorescence. So for that, you need a large number of new technologies because you need a more sensitive system. You need a system that looks everywhere in the retina, not just at the, at, in the middle, and, uh, and so on. So 
we have a new kind of uh, detector. It's pat patented. It's basically turning any photo diode into something more sensitive than a photomultiplier for detecting low photon fluxes. Uh, we have a new way of scanning, which involves uh, uh, concerted uh, quad galvos, four galvos that are very precise in their positioning. That allows you to take the pivot point of the, of the scan from the mirror or behind the mirror, like in all other scanners, and put it in front of the mirror under com uh, computer control, including putting it at the entry uh, of the eye. So therefore, you don't need to dilate the eye. You can cover a larger area of the, of the retina. And uh, this is being patented. And eventually develop a multi-mode hyperspectral uh, ophthalmic scanner that, that looks at, at the retina, not only for these amyloid plaques, autofluorescence, but also for co correlated things that you would like to know uh, what is happening to them, such as vasculature. <clears throat> uh, comparison with other methods of imaging. Uh, this is our method compared with MRI and PET, so you see the advantages. And compared to other confocal laser scanning ophthalmoscopes, uh, it's basically uh, uh, a little bit more versatile and, and covering more, more of the desired features. OK. And there's a pharmaceutical opportunity because uh, about 99% of all candidate drugs for Alzheimer's have failed. But they, in our opinion, they have failed because they try to do something to late stage uh, uh, patients, which really are beyond help, I think. So if you can do early detection, then you can probably do, do better. So uh, the fact that there's an opportunity there is pretty obvious and logical. But if you don't believe me, this gentleman, who's quite young, younger than my son, actually, he made it to the, co to the cover of Forbes by having, uh, 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 going to one of the pharmas and taking one of the failed drugs. He bought it for $5 million. And I think he IPO'd about less than a year later for about $5 billion, because there was hope that that one would actually be useful. OK, uh, I'm not going to talk about this. Optical coherence tomography is a beautiful method. You would like to use it to look in the eye, but it doesn't have the specificity of fluorescence. So Dr. Novacek that I mentioned before came up with a method of making a, a fluorescent OCT. But I didn't bring the figures. This is the last uh, uh, slide of, of data. If you take the multi-mode approach that I was uh, advocating, uh, no matter what it is that you're looking at, you can do very well in sensitivity and specificity. So to conclude, uh, uh, if you, the people of a certain age in the audience may remember this, uh, maybe the younger people don't. It was a, a, a very memorable uh, science fiction movie in which an interdisciplinary team of, of scientists was m miniaturized and injected into the bloodstream of a government scientist who had a major problem in, in his brain. And uh, in a little submarine with lasers. So at the time, this is the mid 60s, lasers were young. So I actually living in LA, I, I actually went and tracked down the prop that, that, <laughs> that was the laser. Uh, Raquel Welsh was in it. Uh, looks like antiquated technology, but uh, the idea was very clear that uh, you can do intervention uh, with lasers and, and in a very kind of uh, guided way. So for my concluding slide here, a vision for the, for the future. Uh, the best way to predict the future is uh, to create it. If you are a physicist, you think that Denis Gabor said this. If you are a business type, then you think that uh, uh, <coughs> Peter, Peter Drucker said it. So here's Mr. Bacon that we mentioned, technologically updated. And he told us that it would be madness and inconsistency to presume that things not yet done can be done except by means not yet tried, which sounds even more contorted in the original Latin. But it's basically calling to arms to, to, to develop new technologies and new approaches. But people, uh, new tools are not everything because men have become tools of their tools. And my old friend Felix de la Iglesia is saying that a, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Uh, Yogi Berra, the sage, is telling us that uh, if you take, come to a fork in the road, take it. So in terms of methods of imaging, uh, we are advocating multi-mode. Let's take that fork. And uh, William Gibson, another science fiction writer, is telling us the future is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed. And I would like to leave you with a quote from uh, Christine Peterson, who is one of the founders of uh, nanotechnology. And she said that if you're looking ahead long term and what you see looks like science fiction, it might be wrong. But if it doesn't look like science fiction, then it's definitely wrong. And additional acknowledgments. Sorry that I ran long, quite long. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, questions? 
thanks for the talk. Many possible questions, but there's one particular thing. You had a slide where you had breast cancer and comparing spectral, your spectral images with uh, histology, histopathology images. And I'm just wondering if you can go back to it and explain what we're seeing. Sure. So we, we were uh, marking with a marker the lo locus because we were not really firm in what exactly we wanted to see in order to preserve it in the same orientation with histopathology. So the, the dark blue stuff, that, that's just a marker. Uh, what, what we were characterizing by, by spectral imaging uh, uh, were pieces of tissue that looked the same to the naked eye and then take the histopathology of it. And actually, I don't have the animation, but we had the zoom in on the histopathology. So, so just by pure spectral segmentation, we were finding regions marked in red that were cancer versus, versus normal, which did not look different to the, to the naked eye and then confirmed by histopathology. Okay, but histopathology images are not the same field. Well, as I said, I had an animation that uh, it was actually the same field, and this is a zoom in on the okay, field. Right. That's, uh, I, I didn't bring that animation, but you know, animations usually don't work in the end. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry for that. But the other, the other breast cancer one was a little bit more interesting because it was a breast cancer that was actually away from the field, and it propagated through the ducts. And, and it was very difficult to find by regular histopathology, and therefore they had to deploy immunohistochemistry. And we were able on the regular histopathology on the H&E, just by spectral segmentation, to find exactly the same areas that immunohistochemistry found that obviously needs additional staining and time and, and, and so forth. Okay, any other questions? I have a quick question um, on the uh, spectral me scattering. Yes. You mentioned at some point that you need a high resolution. Yes. Um, how high the resolution are you talking about? I mean, uh, uh, this, this we change in... We estimate yeah. that it has to be sub-nanometer. So not severely sub-nanometer, but... It corresponds to what sizes in the, for the miscatterers? Uh, yeah, the, if, based on the modeling, if you do it in the visible, uh, this is going from roughly one to two microns to, to six microns. Mm -hmm. For, for the, that covers dysplasia and, and early cancer. Uh, if you go a little bit further out into the near infrared, the oscillations become more pronounced. So therefore, to pick up those oscillations, you really can benefit from the, from the but you can use a, a smaller spectral uh, range because the oscillations, instead of being like this, they, they start being like that. And so we model that, but we also have seen that. So this particular system had about 0.1 nanometer resolution, but obviously it's starved for light in that case. That so allows you to see sizes of? Uh, one, one to three microns, mm -hmm. give or take. One, one to four microns, yeah. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I actually had a question about your work that you do with Hirschsprung's disease. Um, so the transition period is basically um, defined as basically the presence of these nerve cells within the muscle layer of the of the gut, and you know the reason why it's so difficult to determine where to cut is because we want to know what I guess the threshold or the magic number is for the presence of these nerve cells that will basically facilitate gut motility. Yes. So my question is with the spectroscopy that you do, I'm assuming that you are looking at the waveform of these nerve cells and if you found this threshold. Well, actually, we, we did not look mechanistically for those specific nerve cells. What we looked for is the tissue in its spectral signature being different from normal. And as you, you could see, it's, there's a region where it's quite visibly I mean, not visibly, quite uh, uh, re reliably different from normal. But then, as in all things in nature, there's a transition where some of, it, some of the tissue is aganglionic and some of it, is, it has ganglia. And I think that, at least in my guess, uh, that region probably changes even within a couple of days until the intervention is, is done. So what you would really want is to be able to do that characterization, which in certain ways, it's, it's 
almost agnostic as to what the reason is for the, for the discernibility of the difference. So, so we are not drilling down to the level of neurons firing and, and you know, the ganglia working and so forth. It was just requested by the, the, the surgeon that is presented with this on a daily basis, can I be a little bit more confident about where it is that I'm, I'm cutting? So you're not going to cut below the transition region. You're going to cut probably above the transition region to make sure that what remains is all healthy and can be reconnected to the, to, to the tract. So uh, it, it, it's, it's a, almost like a phenomenological thing, but based on good classification. And, and for more difficult problems, you need complete spectral pictures. For this, it turns out that three, three wavelengths would, would be fine. Thank you. Other questions? If not, I think uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, our speaker again.